Good evening, and welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Nick Viest, and I'm the chairperson for Community Board 8, which is on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It covers from 59th Street to 96, Park to the River, and it also includes Roosevelt Island. Tonight, we're joined by one of our co-chairs, the co-chair of the Transportation Committee, Scott Falk, and also Sam Schwartz, the renowned Sam Schwartz, also known as Gridlock Sam. You may know him from his column in the Daily News Traffic Column, but he is a worldwide authority on traffic, highway, bridges, tunnels, you name it. He knows it. In 1982 to 1986, he was New York City's traffic commissioner uh, and then the Department of Transportation chief engineer and first deputy commissioner. Today, his firm, Sam Schwartz Engineering, has six offices around the country and they work on all kinds of transportation projects. We are extremely pleased to have Sam with us. Uh, he's the foremost authority on traffic. Uh, maybe in the world, I don't know. We'll cer certainly speak for our area. Um, but before I, we get into a, a, a bunch of things here, you're, you're known as Gridlock Sam. I was actually told you may have even coined that phrase, Gridlock. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, the public never heard the word Gridlock until 1980. There was a New York City transit strike, and I was the chief architect under Ed Koch, mayor at the time. Uh, for the city's response to the transit strike. And as part of the plan, we wrote something down, which was just a term a few of us in the traffic department used, grid, the grid locking up. And we never made it into one word, grid hyphen lock. And so we had something called the grid lock prevention plan. And at about the third day of the transit strike, some reporter heard the word gridlock. It took off like crazy. William Sapphire called me within days and said, <laughs> where did this word come from? And it turns out I'm the first one that wrote it down as a single word. So I've been credited with the word. I always share it with a fellow engineer, Roy Cottom, who, who since passed away. And the name has stuck with me, Gridlock Sam. Now, that's, a, that's a fantastic story. It's actually migrated. The word has migrated into every aspect of our lives, including politics and everything else. Um, just, just a couple of questions, personal questions I had in terms of how did you get interested in this, in looking at traffic, studying it, understanding it? Where did all that start? Well, it, it certainly didn't start in childhood. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Brownsville, Brooklyn, and Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, uh, the, the one of four children of Polish uh, immigrant parents, uh, Polish Jewish parents who emigrated here between World, War, between World Wars. And my father had a, what one would call a bodega now, but a tiny little grocery store. All the kids worked there and nobody went to college for my family, but I had an older brother who did go to college and he went to college and became a physicist. And I never even heard the word, but it was the only profession that I knew somebody personally in, so I studied physics. And when I was a senior in college, I went to Brooklyn College and I was contemplating graduate school to follow my brother's footsteps. He said, what do you want to be a physicist for? There's no <laughs> money in it. Um, you know, there, there are so few jobs. And he said, at best with my grades, I'd be a mediocre physicist. I thought I was pretty smart until then. <laughs> and then he said, well, what do you like? Right. And uh, I thought, I, I stammered for a while. And finally, it was cities. I really did not like the suburbs. The suburbs took all my best friends away. Mm. The, the suburbs, Los Angeles, took my Brooklyn Dodgers away. I said, I like cities. And he thought, and he said, hmm, math, science, you're pretty good enough for a physicist, but you're good in math and science and cities, transportation. And sure enough, though, it was just starting as a profession. This is the late 1960s. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania, got a degree in transportation wow. engineering. Yeah. Then got a, I drove a, a taxi cab when I came back, and even before that, yeah. and then landed a job at the traffic department, and, and that's how I got into transportation. That's fantastic. Well, we're actually happy you had that conversation with, with your brother. So <laughs> New York is the better for it, so uh, older Thank brothers you. out there yeah. have, a, uh, have a good conversation. Um, 
But what, what we'll do here is we're, we're going to talk about a plan um, that Sam Schwartz has presented to our community board. Uh, it's, it's, the title of it is called Move New York. And it's really looking at, at how the tolling system is set up in New York, the whole uh, bridge transportation system uh, that, that, we, that, that currently serves our city and trying to understand how, how it works, how it can be improved. Does it need to be improved? Sam would say certainly yes. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about understanding um, the, the sort of some of the cost side of it, but also the transportation flows. So we have with us, we're very happy to have with us, Scott Falk, who's our co-chair of the Transportation Committee. He's going to delve into some of the specific aspects of this plan that's been presented to us. So, Scott, uh, to take it away. Well, let me let me first say this is certainly on topic with the nickname Gridlock Sam. Yeah, sure. Uh, because we all know that there's a problem um, on Manhattan streets um, mm -hmm. and perhaps further than just Manhattan. But maybe um, you can start by telling us about uh, what is the problem that faces us right now and then uh, yeah, how did we end up here and what can we do about it? So let me deal with the how, how we ended up here a, a little bit. Uh, I've been around for a very long time and as I mentioned in the 1960s I was a New York City cab driver and I fought New York City traffic back then. I also worked for the post office and I remember in Midtown and we, we went one block a traffic signal cycle, one block a minute. So the problem has been with us for a long time. What we've tried to do over those years is improve traffic by widening roadways, by adding highways, by modernizing traffic signals. And the engineers were actually pretty good at that, but it induced more traffic. So what we ended up with is more traffic congestion. So the answer that I've learned over the years isn't to make solve the traffic problem by opening up as many lanes as possible. Um, I also... You're almost too good at You almost end up being too good at it. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And, right. and there's study after study that shows that it induces traffic mm -hmm. uh, when you do that. So I, you know, o over the years, I, I worked under John Lindsay, was the first mayor I worked under, uh, very far under. I was career civil servant. I was uh, entry level, but I worked on the John Lindsay plan to put tolls on the East and Harlem River bridges. 1973, the plan was adopted by the city and uh, it only an act and the state and the federal government went further than any other plan and only an act of Congress could stop it. And in fact, in 1977, an act of Congress stopped it. We had a new right. mayor, Beam. He enlisted Elizabeth Holtzman and uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, two of our most progressive elected officials, and they just put the kibosh on it because it's, it's such an easy home run in Brooklyn, Queens, say, no tolls on the bridges. 1980, during the transit strike, by then I was an assistant commissioner and I was the chief architect, as I said, of the transit strike plan, and uh, we were hailed as heroes after the 11 days that we ran the city with no subways and for the first couple of days, no railroads. And 90% of the people got to work. Remarkable. And people said, hey, let's try some of these things out. Yeah. Well, one of the things we had were occupancy restrictions. And so I said, well, if you want to drive in by yourself, you can't use one of the free bridges. You have to use a toll facility. And it was a form of congestion pricing. I, I, the city of New York, and me as representing the city, we were sued by the Automobile Club, uh, the AAA, and as well as the garage owners. And we lost the lawsuit saying the city didn't have the authority. Fast forward to uh, Mike Bloomberg, and he comes up with a plan in 2007, 2008, and that plan dies without even a vote. There was a city council home rule vote, but there was never a state vote. So I, I've really been looking at this for many, many years and finding out that there are some fundamental reasons that it fails. And it fails in Brooklyn, it fails in Queens, it fails on Long Island and Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And one of the, and so I spent my time for the past three or four years, and by the way, I'm, I'm doing this 
on my own and happy to do it as, as a child of New York, and New right. York's given a lot to me, so that's not, a, I'm not, I have no client here, right. which is wonderful when you have no client. So uh, what, what I'm doing is spending a lot of time in the places where people are normal opponents to the Bloomberg plan or were opponents to the Bloomberg plan. So let's plan. back up for a second. Let's talk about what the pro what's the problem, really? That it's so a New Yorker living out in, in, in Brooklyn, I lived in Queens for many years, you would say, well, okay, I'm, I'm happy having, being able to get into the city, drive over the 59th Street Bridge, excuse me, the Ed Koch Bridge, and, and not pay anything, and that's fair to me, okay? I think that's a good, good deal, and it's fair. Why, why should I pay something to go over these bridges? That's, yeah. that's my, my question. Yeah, and, and everybody asks that question. Uh, first of all, the bridges were all built with tolls in mind, and the Queensboro Ed Koch Bridge was built with tolls. I have photos of the toll booths. Um, and the Brooklyn Bridge was built with tolls, the so Manhattan Bridge, uh, the, the Williamsburg Bridge. They all had tolls, and the tolls were to maintain the bridges. And in 1911, not too long after unification of the five boroughs, Mayor William Gaynor said, as part of unification, why don't we remove the tolls? Well, he removed the tolls, but he never told the bridges that there wasn't a dedicated revenue stream. Right. For about 40 years, until World War II, the city still had this ethos of maintaining things properly, building and maintaining. Post-World War II, we forgot. We didn't even know who was responsible for the bridges. It's embarrassing to say, but people used to point fingers. No, you were supposed to paint the bridge. You were supposed to clean the bridge. So fast forward to the 1970s and 1980s, the elevated West Side Highway collapses while I was in city government, fell to the ground due to corrosion. Uh, parts of the Brooklyn Bridge, cables snapped, killing right. a Japanese tourist on the bridge. So this is the problem. These bridges need maintenance because the, the steel corrodes in, in the bridge is correct. And, That's and, right. And, and the, just give people an idea the cost involved in that in that type of maintenance there, there are two types of costs one is doing maintenance and the remainder is capital repairs mm -hmm. if you do maintenance correctly if you have a steady funding stream and the maintenance is not high tech it's cleaning it's getting the salt off the bridges um, it's lubricating the movable parts of the bridges that's probably less than a dollar a trip on the bridge but we, since we've let it go for so long, we had to shut bridges, we had fatal accidents, and so part is to maintain the bridges. The other part for that person in Queens is that person in Queens, when he tries or she tries to leave Queens by almost any other route, pays a toll. So if they're going out to the Throgs Neck Bridge, pays a toll. Going out to Connecticut, let's say, or going to, uh, from Whitestone to Castle Hill to go shopping, pays a toll, or over the Tribar Bridge to go to a Yankee game. I'm a Mets fan, so why do, they shouldn't leave the borough. But they, they go to a Yankee game. They have to pay a toll. They go to the Rockaways. They have to pay a toll. And those tolls have gotten so high because the people at the four free bridges are not paying any tolls. Right. So there's that lack of fairness. Yet at the Manhattan Bridge, for example, you have four subway lines that are being subsidized by the people in Queens that are going across the Whitestone Bridge or the Throgs Neck Bridge or the people in Staten Island going across the Verrazano right. Bridge. I'll, I'll let Scott get into it. There's one other point I wanted to make, though, that this it's a question of, there's a fairness question, but a, a real practical question of allocation of money of capital toward where you need it right i mean in 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 the best in the best world it seems to me that what you want to try to do when you're running things anyway is to is to allocate the capital where it's needed you 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 prefer not to sort of tax someone for something not related and then take that money and apply it to something completely different so that that's it seems to me this is what you are 
getting at with this yeah. basic plan and, and your discussion with people who cross those bridges now for free, you're saying, well, wait a minute now, is this really the best way that, that we can do it? it? Not only the fairest way, but also in terms of how we run things, is this really the best way to do it? Yeah, uh, you know, and, and just to follow up on that, it, it, what I'm also hearing is the person that's taking that Throgs Neck Bridge and going north-south and paying $15 round trip, or if it's a truck or $80, most of that money is going for a radial system into Manhattan. So why are we paying or charging them? Every time the MTA needs money, we go to the Rockaways, we go to Staten Island, we go to Throgs Neck. It doesn't make sense. Right, so those are areas where there aren't necessarily as many alternatives the way with the Manhattan Bridge. There's no charge to drive over it, even though there are many other ways to get across the East River. Right. So I've heard you refer to um, a major element of your plan as wiping the slate clean. Um, so if we were to wipe the slate clean on these tolls and start over in a new way that's fairer, how would we do that? Well, I, I think what you'd have to do, first of all, is have some rules. And what is the purpose of the tolls? So the purpose of pricing is, A, uh, to maintain the facilities. So you need to have some basic maintenance. B, you should apply tolls as a pricing mechanism where you have two ingredients, and that is you have serious congestion and you have really good alternatives. And that's not Staten Island. That's not Castle Hill. That's, that's not Mill Basin. That is Manhattan's central business district. So what I would do by wiping the slate clean and doing that, because the only reason we have tolls in certain places are because of Mayor William Gaynor, who removed the tolls from some locations, Robert Moses, who put tolls up at every bridge and tunnel that he built, and then Nelson Rockefeller, who said, I'm going to take whatever extra money there is from tolls and give it to a subway system that goes right into the center of Manhattan. That's, that's it. There isn't any logic to it. So what if we applied logic? If the money is going to a central area, shouldn't that central area, those people driving by car, contribute because they get a benefit by more people being in the subways and not on the roads with them? Right. Okay, um, so what what would you do um, once you're looking at those rules? I, I think um, I've heard you talk in the past about uh, maybe lowering tolls in certain places, raising tolls or instituting tolls in, in other places. Uh, so um, what, what kind of toll rates do you see in some of these different places? You know, is the Throgs Neck somewhere you would lower the toll, for example? Yeah, yeah. So if you look at where Robert Moses you know, built uh, a lot of his facilities, uh, the only way to get directly from Queens to the Bronx is via a toll facility. I would lower those tolls by $5, whether it was Easy Pass or whether it was uh, cash. Same thing at the Verrazano Bridge. And same thing at about, uh, it's a smaller rate at the Rockaways, but about a, close to a 50% lowering on the Rockaways. And that would also help business. It helps those communities, but also a lot of trucks use those particular corridors. And then what I would do is take the tolls that they, we're charging people today at the Throgs Neck Bridge and restore. Remember, we had tolls on the East River Bridges. Restore the tolls to the four East River Bridges at the exact same rate that we have today at the Throgs Neck or at the Midtown Tunnel or at the Battery Tunnel so nobody shops for bridges, and I'll get to the Queensboro in a second. And then again, across 60th Street, much as the mayor had planned to do, so every motor vehicle that enters Manhattan south of 60th Street would be charged a toll to come into Manhattan south of 60th Street. But every motorist that was crossing a bridge elsewhere would pay a lot less than they're paying now, about 50% less. And the thing about the Queensboro, and I know Community Board 8 has the Queensboro Bridge in it, is it's the only bridge in the world, nobody has ever corrected me on saying this, so I believe I'm right, that is sandwiched so closely between two toll crossings, the Midtown Tunnel and the Triborough Bridge. So what happens every single day, and I did a mathematical model 
looking historically at toll increases and what happened to the traffic volume at the Queensboro Bridge. Every time there was a toll increase, there was a traffic volume increase at the Queensboro Bridge. And when you add it all together, every single day, 40,000 cars, trucks, buses that are drive out of their way to avoid the tolls on both sides of the Queensboro Bridge to use the Queensboro Bridge. They leave highways, the LIE, the GCP, the BQE, to use city streets. Right. And they use right. the city streets of Long Island City, of Sunnyside, of the Upper East Side, of East Midtown. And when you look at traffic fatalities and traffic crashes, hot spots are on both sides of the bridge. So no community has been hit harder by this cockamamie pricing policy that we have than Community Board 8, maybe Community Board 6, and also the communities right on the other side of the Queensboro Bridge. So how would, so if you, you put toll, say, on the on those bridges, how, how does that, how does it get set up? They would, would they be tolls like we have now, uh, or uh, say on the Triborough, or how, how, you know, physically how are these tolls, what are they going to look like? Yeah, the tolls will look like your cell phone. I mean, there, there won't be anything that you'll notice that's different. When you go to London, um, there's not a toll booth that's set up. London has pricing or Stockholm or any of the major cities. Uh, toll booths are anachronisms. Uh, I would get rid of all the toll booths that we have to make people happier in those other areas. What you find is you, you get well into the high 90s compliance and your enforcement. Uh, is there going to be somebody that somehow eludes the police? Yes, but I wouldn't put toll booths up anymore. Uh, it'll either be easy pass, license plate photography, your telephone. There's so many different ways to collect. You will never notice it. So, so this toll, these tolls would work as you're going into the city, right? And yes. then coming out, would you also be? Would you also pay a toll? Well, right, right now the way I show it, just for the ease of understanding it, is the Midtown Tunnel. You pay both ways. Right. So I show it as both ways, but ultimately it only makes sense to to do it inbound, as is done at the. Um, uh, Lincoln Tunnel in the Holland Tunnel. Do you recommend having these 24 hours a day, or would you have peak times, or would you change the rates? Is there anything you've looked at there? Yeah, yeah, I, I have, and, and if people look at my presentation, you'll see it says it's a flat rate, but then it refers to may change by time of day. Uh, it, originally, I had a clock, and, I, and you watched it change. I would change it based on conditions, maybe chase, change them um, based on traffic conditions, uh, Singapore, for example, every quarter evaluates the traffic, and if the traffic, if it's too slowly, they'll raise the rates. If it's faster, they'll lower the right, rates right. on it. So there, things are, are, we're, we're able to do so much with technology and GPS technology today. We could charge by using Fifth Avenue more than First Avenue, or vice versa. You want to see the tree at Christmas time? Uh, I, I know I just started using Uber because I'm walking with a cane at the moment, and they told me the other day it was raining in the morning that I would have to pay two two point seven five times the normal fare because they were using congestion pricing and and the demand pricing mechanism. Why don't we use that to our, to what's our most precious resource? So when you look at Community Board Eight, it's land. You don't have open space. Right. So, so, but you might also be able to create a system where there are people who come in at night at, at a slower time. They might pay less than, say, people That's who correct. are coming in during peak hours, uh, peak rush hours. So, so the, so the, it's, it's, a, it's a flexible system that way, and it actually reflects the usage. That's, so that, that's, that's, that's right. the whole intent of but we now have technology that allows us to do this in a sense. Mm -hmm. so, so it's uh, something that's very worth having a conversation about. But I was curious to see how your conversations have gone with the folks out in, the other, in, in, in Queens and in Brooklyn. I also want to say to our audience that this is part one. We get, we get two for the price of one because Sam's going to come back and do another show for us, which we're thrilled about. So uh, anyway, if we don't cover something, we'll probably cover it in the next show. So, so going back to that question, how, how, how have you been received uh, in, in Brooklyn or in Queens when you've given this presentation? Yeah, I've been doing this for about three years now, and I started by listening. 
And what I'm hearing in Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, the Bronx is thank you. Somebody's listening to us. And we're also including in the overall plan many measures that people in those parts of the boroughs were looking for because they felt they were the biggest contributors because men, they drive more than the people, say, in Community Board 8, and they were getting little or nothing for it. So the reception has been overwhelmingly positive, not to say there aren't opponents still. There are some opponents, but we've had some major changes. Remember, I, I told you that the AAA sued me in 1980. The AAA is shoulder to shoulder with us, saying we want to be part of the solution here. Um, the Trucking Association, which opposed the Bloomberg plan, they're on board because we're all sitting at the table coming up with collective decisions as to what is good. And one of the things that's important to people in the other areas is that their roads and bridges are maintained decently. So a chunk of the money is going to go to roads and bridges, whereas all previous plans had 100% of the money going to transit. Our roads and bridges are in pretty lousy shape. And we, we're also looking at a number of other features that help those other areas. But Manhattan gets helped tremendously by fewer vehicles, by straightening out the trips, by having capital money for continuing the Second Avenue subway and other measures. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, there's plenty more to talk about, but that's actually about all the time we have for this first episode. <laughs> uh, but there's wow. lots more to talk about with Gridlock Sam Schwartz. Great.